Give me a second. It's fine. Okay. Okay. Let's start. Okay. Okay. So, um, first of all, thank you for letting me talk here. So, um, I'm going to, my name is Pietro Relli. I'm going to talk about this work, the uh, Ustatoli's whistle line construction of a circuitor earlier conformal blocks. Uh, this presentation is based on a work in collaboration with Vladimir Belavne and Juan Ramos Cabezas. Um, so, let me start just giving. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just giving um, the plan of the talk to, today. So, first of all, I am giving some introduction in which I describe the the aim of the work, the quantity that we are going to compute in the last. Uh, we want to compute in the work, which is the uh, one point conformal block. In order to do this, I have to give some very brief introduction on some preliminaries, in particular the algebra that you're going to consider, which is the W3 algebra, but then actually the S31, because we are going to consider the conformal block in a particular limit in which S31 algebra becomes the relevant, the relevant one. Uh, this computation will be uh, done in using three different techniques, very different also from in the background. The first one is the usual, the definition of the, coming from the definition of the block. So with techniques that is based on conformal field theories. Uh, the second te techniques is based on the so-called AGT correspondence. I will give a very, very brief sketch intro introduction of this correspondence. This is not the, the main argument of the talk, of course. So again, it's very brief and sketchy. But yeah, just to give the background in which this computation is, uh, uh, is embedded. And at, at the end, I will give the, um, the, the main method that, that we want to use and we, we used in the, in the work, which is the whistle line construction. Uh, in order to explain how this method works, I have to give also, a, again, a very brief introduction description of the, of the 3D chain thymus theory in the context of the ADS3 CFT correspondence. So, uh, as I said, the, uh, the quantity that we want to compute in this, that we compute, we try to compute in this work is the one point correlation function uh, on the torus, on a torus in a conformal field theory with symmetry algebra given by the W3 algebra, but in this large central charge limit. Um, first of all, let us uh, remind what, uh, how it is defined this uh, one point correlation function we can uh, at least we can express the, the one point correlation function on the torus in this way uh, here we have introduced the this, this parameter q is the elliptic parameter on the on the of the torus uh, we the, uh, the this quantity depends on the on this vector alpha this is a root vector vector actually parameterize the internal representation uh, and we are going to sum over this, but uh, it, it, this alpha not goes on, over all the representation, but only on some of them that are allowed by uh, the so-called fusion rules. It depends actually, uh, it depends on the particular theory that we are considering is not completely general. These C over here are the so-called structure constant. Again, they depend on, uh, on, they depend on the uh, this internal representation, also the external one, the one in which we express the, the field here. And uh, the, the loss quantity, uh, this F over here, is the one point holomorphic uh, conformal block, which actually is the quantity that we compute in this work, the, the real quantity, not the correlation function, but uh, we focus on the block. And uh, this quantity actually uh, the, the, this depends on the on the represent internal and external representation and on the modular parameters. And in general, is a universal object in the sense that it is uh, it depends on the uh, it is given by the conformal symmetry, and not the specific theory we are considering. Um, so, um, as I anticipated in the in, when I described the plan of the talk, we are going to use three techniques that are become. Uh, from very different uh, situation. So I, I'm just giving now the, again, a sort of uh, plan of what we are going to do just to remind, but 
the first computation that we are going to do is use the techniques coming from conformal field theories. And so the definition that we get before, essentially. Uh, then uh, um, we try to use another technique coming from a very different background, which is the IGT correspondence. And finally, we uh, exploit the ADS3 CFT2 duality and this particular construction of the so called Wilson network operators. I will give the definition, uh, I will describe how it is uh, uh, constructed then. Um, but uh, again, uh, I've said that uh, the conformal blocks depends on the theory, on the symmetry of the theory. So let us see what symmetry we are considering, in particular the, uh, the W3 algebra, what it, does it mean? So uh, the W3 uh, the conformal field theory uh, and the W3 symmetry is generated by the energy momentum tensor, as I usual, conformal field theories, and uh, an higher spin current. So there is a kind of generalization of the usual uh, Virasoro algebra, uh, ex extension, sorry. Um, and so the symmetry is generated by the, as I said, the, the usual energy momentum tensor, whose expansion is the, the following one. And from this uh, new spin three current, which is this W current over here, and uh, looking at the commutation relation of the modes, uh, we can find that the L uh, uh, modes behaves like, uh, so satisfy the usual Virasoro commutation relations. And here we have the commutation relation between the L modes and the W mode, which give us also the, the spin of the new current. And then the, this very, uh, this nonlinear commutation relation between the the, the W modes, it's important, which is, the, the fact is, uh, that it is not linear relation because actually it's not a Lie algebra, but uh, it was found that it uh, satisfy the Jacobi uh, identities anyway. So, um, so the, these are the computational relations that defines the algebra, uh, but let us see how we can uh, uh, parameterize the primary fields and the field content in, in the in this uh, uh, in this theory. So uh, first of all, ju just let me say that we are often often we will use these uh, um, UV parameterization of the central charge. So we introduce the parameter this parameter B, and the uh, vector alpha that allows us to parameterize the the fields uh, is a vector in the root space. Uh, which can be expressed in terms of the fundamental weights W1 and W2 of the asset of a uh, tree. And uh, in general, it, it, it takes this form over here, this, this expression here. Um, in general, I think it can be also uh, a representation can be also parameterized by two different, two other quantities that are the conformal dimension and the charge or W3 charge sometimes called it. Uh, which in terms of the vector alpha have the uh, following uh, expression over here. Um, so as usual, in order to construct the actual representation, we start uh, uh, defining the highest weight vector of a W3, and it is defined in, uh, essentially in the usual way, like this. And uh, it, uh, these highest weight vectors satisfy uh, the following conditions. So the, the conformal dimension that we defined before is the eigenvalue of the uh, mode L0. The charge, the W3 charge is the eigenvalue of the mode W0. And uh, the highest, the highest weight sorry, vector is annihilated by all the uh, modes with uh, positive uh, in, in subscript index, index. So in general, a W3 module Associated, associated to a given IS weight vector is uh, the, the, the vector space spanned by a, a so called a basis of the segment, as you uh, say, uh, defined in this way. So, defined in this way over here. So, with uh, an application of the, uh, with the action, sorry, of the generators of W and L, uh, we use this convention here on, on the of the indices, this order here as a convention. And uh, also we, I will use in the next, the, the, this notation over here where the integer n is given by the sum 
of all the indices uh, that appears in this descendant. This is called also level of the descendant. Um, okay, so I, I give a, a very brief sketch of the, what a W3 algebra is. Uh, okay, it can be described, but let us going to talk about also the S3 algebra. We're going to do this, this because the computation we are interested in is made in the large central charge limit. And in, the, in this uh, case, we see that we can uh, consider as uh, uh, as relevant generators only the one that actually generates the uh, least subalgebra, the S3 least subalgebra of the W algebra. Uh, this S3 subalgebra is generated by just this generator over here, not the whole before, and satisfy the usual S3 commutation relation that are this one. And uh, now it is, it is a real uh, Lie algebra, true Lie algebra. So also maintaining this uh, re relation with the previous algebra we introduced, the W3, uh, we can also notice that um, the vector alpha we introduced before in order to parameterize the, 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 uh, the, the representation now, uh, in order to have non, uh, let's say, physical, physical representation. So um, uh, conform a dimension that, that does not go to infinity. We have to, uh, we, we see that the vector behaves in this way, in this, uh, this limit here. And so the representation now are uh, parameterized by this vector J, uh, which is a simple uh, combination of the fundamental weights of the S3, of course. And of course, uh, also the module of the S3 algebra formally can be defined in the same way as, the, as we have done for the W3 module, but now we have to consider that the generators that are involved in all the definition are only this generator here and not the full generator of the uh, W3 algebra. Uh, before uh, going on with the actual, let's say, computation, let us give me a, a point out one important fact that is the, the fact that we are not going to compute one point conformal blocks of general external fields uh, but we are going to focus only on the so-called semi-degenerate fields that are the fields in which the vector uh, of the root space uh, of this particular form here so it's actually uh, the uh, the vector j j1 in this case but uh, it depends only on uh, one fundamental weight. We we can consider the first one in general. And now A is a non-negative integer as M1 and M2 before, but now we are considered just A. Uh, it can be shown that in this particular case for semi-degenerate fields, it also holds the relation here between the W1 and the W minus one and L minus one generators. Uh, which of course, where of course, uh, H1 and Q1 are the uh, conformal dimension and the charge respectively of the new field, of the same degenerate field. Uh, we are going to restrict to this particular kind of fields in order to have the most, the, the possibility uh, to, the, in order to avoid the, 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 the presence of uh, possible multiplicity in the, in the representation, uh, which uh, can cause a, a, an obstruction in the computation of the blocks. Uh, and also we see also that the, this, this, um, this relation here allows us to compute using the definition the the block. Um, I'm going to show immediately now, because again, let, let us start seeing how we compute from the simple by the definition of in conformal field theories, how the computation of the block uh, can, can be can be done. So this is the definition again of the conformal block, uh, where we introduce this G is the so-called Shapovalov matrix. It is this matrix over here? Again, M and N are the level uh, of the descendant we are considering, here, and we have to sum over all these levels. Um, we want to consider the uh, large central charge limit of this quantity, so we are not computing in the whole W3 algebra. And we, uh, we, we, we can see that a possibility is to restrict uh, the fields to belongs only to an S3 module and not to a full W3 module. Actually, this is not the only possibility. We are going to see then um, a case in which this new possibility arise. But 
it, it is one. Uh, it is one possible way to computing this limit, the block, one possible definition of the block in the large central charge limit. And so we, we here we compute this particular block that is often called also global block. Uh, so thanks to the restriction to the uh, for, for the external field to be a semi-degenerate one, uh, now we are able to compute the matrix element over here. Uh, because in general we, we do not we, we do not know the uh, representation of the W uh, mode as a differential operator, so we are not able to compute with the usual the simply with the algebra uh, with the commutation relation. We are not uh, able to compute this quantity here. But since we have the previous uh, relation between the these generators, we we are able to do this. And okay, so. Simply using the, the usual techniques that are using conformal field theory. So using the commutation relation of the algebra and moving the generator from one side to the other side when they are near it and so on and so forth, we obtain the following result. I just show you, it's not, I'm not going to mention, uh, to, to describe too much about this result here. Um, but we can see also simply looking at the result that, uh, increasing the order of the computation uh, of, of, the Q, of the expansion in Q, uh, the computation becomes very fast, very difficult uh, and tedious. So the idea is to try to find a way to, to, to do this computation that can be a bit more uh, easier, uh, let's say. Um, so the first idea is to use the AGT correspondence. Uh, as anticipated before, I'm not going to talk about the AGT. Uh, it's just to give, uh, to describe the background of the, in which this computation is embedded. Um, so it, it's very sketchy what I'm going to say now. So I'm sorry for uh, the, the expert in, in this field now, but uh, so AGT correspondence was introduced by Aldai Gaiotto and Tachikawa uh, as a relation between some particular four-dimensional gauge theory, uh, SUN supersymmetric, SU2, sorry, supersymmetric gauge theory, and two-dimensional conformal field theories. In particular, the, this relation that they found uh, was found uh, between the parameters, they, they uh, express a, a relation between the parameters in the, in the two theories that allows to relate the so-called necrasal distance on partition function of the gauge theory in the uh, with a uh, so-called omega deformation with the conformal block of the conformal uh, field theory, the two-dimensional conformal field theory. Uh, this, uh, this correspondence was uh, found for the SU2 gauge theories, but then it, it was uh, announced this, uh, this correspondence. In particular, what we are interested in is the fact that it was found uh, correspondence between the WN conformal field theories in general and uh, N equals to uh, a supersymmetric gauge theory with uh, SUN gauge uh, algebra. Um, so, the, again, very briefly, very schematically, um, from, from the gauge theory side, the, the important quantity is the so called Necrasov distance on partition function. Uh, this, this partition function was obtained by Necrasov considering a deformation of the Lagrangian by two deformation parameters that define the so called omega deformations. These deformation parameters are epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. Schematically, very schematically, the full partition function uh, factorizes essentially in uh, three contributions a classical one, a one loop one, and an instant of one, that, the, which is the one we are interested in. Uh, the instanton partition function in general depends on four parameters, four kind of parameters, sorry. Uh, the deformation parameter, epsilon one and epsilon two, uh, a mass parameter, uh, in general we have n and can have, we can have n mass parameters. In our case, we have just one. Um, the, these are the mass parameters of the fundamental hypermultiplet. And then the, the so called um, Coulomb parameters say, you have N, these, uh, capital N of these parameters, 
and we, they are the vacuum expectation value of joint scale. So we are in a particular gauge uh, theory, which this content of, uh, yeah, this particular content, so it's not, it's a specific gauge theory. It can be shown that this uh, part the class of this phantom partition function can be also computed as a sum of uh, uh, young diagrams. In particular, the in in our in the case we are interested in, that is the W three, the case in which from the CFT side we have a W three theory. Uh, the instanton partition function can be computed in this way here, where we sum over all the um, all the young diagrams, and each order in Q is defined by all the diagrams that have the same number of boxes. Uh, here we have used these. Uh, uh, this Q I have defined before, Q is a combination of B, uh, of the parameters B uh, and its inverse. Um, okay. We are going to relate also to, to, the, to the parameters in the gauge theory. But, um, and the, this uh, function E over here uh, is defined in this way, where we introduce the, where A are the comes from the gauge from the Coulomb uh, uh, are the Coulomb parameters, and uh, we have used the leg length. We have introduced sorry, uh, the leg length and the arm length of the Young diagrams. We are the boxes of the Young diagrams we are considering, um, which which are the Yes, respectively the horizontal and vertical distances of the box from the edge of the diagram Y. So um, this comes just from the gauge theory side, but um, it was found that he, given a, a proper identification of the parameters of the gauge theory that we introduced before with some parameters of the conformal field theories, we can establish a relation between the instanton partition function and the conformal blocks. So in particular, in our case, in which the uh, internal representation can be parameterized by this vector, which in general is M1, uh, M2, as we explained before. And the external uh, one is this here, this alpha one here, so just one integer A. Uh, B is the usual uh, Liouville parameter, and if we, perform this substitution here, this identification here, we have that the instanton partition function we, we wrote before with this new value of the parameters, of course, uh, is given by the, the conformal blocks and the prefactor, often called U1 factor, but yes, it is this, this factor over here. And so this allows us to, to compute essentially these, uh, the, the conformal block on the torus, the one-point conformal block on the torus. Now, the problem, uh, the problem, the fact is that this conformal block here uh, is not exactly the global blocks we computed before from the with the definition from CFT. Uh, this is uh, called the light block. Essentially, it's due to the fact that, uh, as I said before, uh, we consider as the limit of the block. Uh, the one in which only the subalgebra, the F3 subalgebra is involved. Actually, this is not the only possibility because there are other limits in which uh, the one point conformal block can be computed, can be defined, uh, avoiding uh, divergences. Uh, and this is one of them. Uh, this is one of these, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, this is one uh, of the possible, uh, let's say, uh, block that we can have and this is called the light block. Uh, this, this light block is the one that we obtain from the AGT. Um, in order to overcome this problem, this, this difference, uh, we propose the following relation between the light block here and the global block over here, um, where we introduce on the right hand side the W3 character and the S3 character here. We propose this, uh, this relation in analogy to what it was proven to be true for the, uh, let's say, lower spin case, that, are, that is the Vera solo case and that's a two algebra on the other side. 
it was shown that this um, relation is true, is valid for the case. So we propose the, the same relation for the uh, the case of W3 and the SL3. So sorry, and, this relation, yeah. I'm sorry, this relation holds, I mean, the, the ratio of conformal local and global ones is the ratio of characters on the, in, in the limit, right? In large uh, Yes. Yes, yes, in the large central chart, yes. Because, because otherwise, I mean, it can be true. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 of course, of course, in the limit, sure. Isn't it obvious, I mean, just from representation point of view, that uh, I'll just, I mean, the, the ratio is just the, I mean, as you said, just the ratio of characters, um, because we just count the number of of states which are not which are yeah basically in the Rasora case it's just simple right so because it, it, any field is just a derivative of a, of a conformal state so you just that's why that's why you just divided the wall Rasora character by this what for S2 3 this is also no. Okay, uh, um, sorry, probably. Uh, I, I, I'm not so, yeah, I, I have to think about this. I, I don't know very well. Um, because uh, you just expand, you, you have a sub algebra, right? Uh, you have your W algebra, you have a SL, SL3 sub algebra, and you just any representation, any model. Of, of of a large algebra, you can expand this direct sum of models over small algebra, as we usually do, right? And so the mm -hmm. number, the number of small representations in the, in the places where they appear, you just obtain from the you just divide two characters, and this is how you get it. No, probably some, something. I'm saying something wrong here, but. Uh, for me, it seems uh, like this formula is kind of falls from the definition, but probably I, I just misunderstand mis something. Well, I, 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 I cannot answer uh, very well because uh, I remember uh, a bit the, 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 the proof of the statement. Actually, it's a bit technical. It's, it's not so immediate. Maybe it can be done quickly, uh, but... So, mm -hmm. yeah, I understand your point, but I, I, I cannot, I, I'm not able to answer to you now, right now. No, you're just saying that, I mean, this is certainly true that you can just expand. You, you, you have your, say for Virasor, you have your Verma model, and it, yeah. it's just infinite direct sum of actually Verma models, but for SL2 with shifted dimensions. Uh, but mm -hmm. then highest ways. But then you're saying that in the limit of large and charge, they all of them are mostly the same. And that's why when you compute the block, then all of them are, you can just factor them out. What uh, and the rest will be just uh, the counting function we just shows you the places where all those um SL2 highest weights will appear and this is how you prove it. Mm, probably mm, probably this is not uh, the case. All right, so I'm, I'm sorry, probably it, no, uh, but if, you, if you proceed, yeah. Yeah, I, I will think about this. Uh, mm -hmm, all right, all right. I don't know now. It's, um but yeah, it's, um but yeah we we uh we propose we, we use this relation and in our case and it, it can it comes to it, it gives us the, the right resulting part. So we obtain the exactly the uh the, the global box that I wrote before by uh, with, with the computation that I described uh previously. And so yeah. Um, so in this way we have found we have used two different methods, very different from uh very different side and um we obtained the same result uh the next step consisting using again 
another kind of method, um, which is based uh, on the ADS3 CFT2 correspondence, uh, essentially. Uh, this method uh, um, was also proved to work in the case of the SF2 algebra for the torus topology and also for the SF3 algebra for the spheric topology. Our idea is to try to use it for the SF3 algebra in the torus topology. Uh, mainly is based on the so construction of the so-called Wilson network operator, which is this kind of operator that uh, we claim to allows us to compute the, the block, but before uh, answer to, to the question, so how we can build, how, how it is build this uh, Wilson network operator, uh, I have to record some, again, very sketchy, but some notions about Chen Simon's theory, uh, because it's the, the 3D, the Chen Simon's theory is the bulk dual of the CFT we are interested in, so. Um, okay, so, it is a established fact that the two plus one dimensional Einstein Libert action uh, with negative cosmological constant can be written in terms of the difference of two Chen Simons action in this way, uh, where the Chen Simons action is this action over here. Here we have that this uh, level, the, this uh, constant here, K, is related uh, to the three-dimensional Newton constant in this way, uh, where uh, R is the S3 radius. Uh, the trace here is the standard invariant killing form, and the manifold we are going, which we are going to integrate is the three-dimensional space-time. Um, and then we have introduced A and A bar, but it is uh, yes, one that the, uh, yes, it's almost the same, but um, a is the chiral gauge connection. It is a, a, a one form uh, valued in the gauge group, and it, it is essentially given by composition of the fifth line of the tetrad and of the spin connection, in this case. Um, in particular, we are interested in the case in which the gauge group of the chain Simons is the uh, is SF3, uh, is SF3 times SF3, so uh, in which case A is an SF3 gauge connection. Uh, in order to obtain an SL3 uh, algebra from the CFT side. So um, if we try, if we compute the equation of motion from the previous action, we find that uh, they are simply the flat condition of the, on the connection. Uh, it was shown, it can be shown that uh, with a proper choice of the boundary conditions, uh, on the connection and uh, in a proper choice of the local coordinates, uh, essentially we have a radial coordinate and uh, two uh, morphic and holomorphic coordinates. Uh, the flat connection can be written as gauge transform boundary connection of this kind, uh, where the new connection omega here is uh, can be written in this way, uh, with, with this specific gauge group element here, the transformation. Uh, here, uh, in the definition in the, of this uh, omega, in the form of this omega expression, we have that T is the boundary energy momentum tensor, C is the central charge, uh, it is defined um, by the brown no relation, so it is this form here, uh, it's proportional to the level K, and um, the L1 and L-1 here are the generators of the S3 gauge algebra. Yeah. Um, since we are interested to do the computation on the torus, we are interested to the case in which the there is a periodic time, uh, so this is called thermal IDS3. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, we choose the as we, we have as a boundary energy momentum tensor the, this energy momentum tensor over here, and so this form here, so the connection. We are interested in. We are going to consider in what follows uh, of this kind is this composition of the uh, generator cell one and l minus one. Um, okay, so uh, we we have let's say fixed the notation in some sense. Uh, but uh, now we first of all let us define the uh, 
the building block of the construction that you are going to, to explain later. Uh, this is the whistle line operator. The sort of whistle line operator, it is defined in this way. It's quite easy. Where uh, it, 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 it depends, sorry, on two points of the space time x, x and y, and on the representation in which we decide to represent these uh, generator here, of course. Um, then in order to be what we are going to call the Wilson network operator, we uh, need uh, the following element. Uh, first of all, a, a field on the boundary, let's say phi alpha. This is attached to a bulk to boundary whistle line. So a whistle line uh, W in the same representation of the field, uh, which depends on uh, on the points that alpha to which uh, which we associate to the field in the boundary, at the boundary point, and a point in the bulk, Z B here. Then we can have general bulk to bulk whistle line operator, uh, which are Wilson uh, line, which depends on, of course, on a representation, but of two points which are both in the bulk. In general, uh, these Wilson line operators act trivially for contractible loops. Uh, but we are going to see that since we are interested in the torus, uh, this bulk to bulk uh, Wilson line operator will be important. Um, the last uh, ingredient is the vertex in the bulk. This is obtained when the three whistle line uh, meet uh, each other in the same point associated to three different uh, representation in general. Uh, this is described by the so-called trivalent intervening operator, which is a, uh, essentially a projection. Uh, is this kind of operator here, which satisfy this, this property, uh, this kind of consistency property for, uh, for uh, in order to be cage invariant. Uh, consists of the gauge transformation. Uh, here, of course, we have that U is a, an element of the gauge group in the in the in the different representation that we label with a alpha, alpha, beta, and gamma. So, just to give a picture graphical of what we are going to, to construct, the, this is the, the picture essentially we have on, on the on the boundary. We have three different states in three different points. Uh, associated to three different representation. Uh, from, from each point on the boundary, we can, uh, uh, our whistle line uh, starts and three whistle lines of this kind can uh, meet uh, each other on, the, on a point in the bulk, the B. And so the quantity that we are going to uh, associate to this kind of construction is this uh, uh, matrix element here. Um, okay, so uh, this, this is in, in, like in general, is the general picture, but in, in order to obtain the quantity that, that we want, so the one point block, uh, let's say, first of all, as a, um, we, we, we are going to perform the computation on the torus. So in general, um, for instance, if we, if we consider trivial topology like the sphere, uh, there is um, no dependence on the bulk point since there are no contractible loops. So the, the bulk to bulk with are always are always trivial. This is not the case, of course, we are in the torus. So there is a one, uh, there is a, an important bulk to bulk whistle line, which is in general the whistle loop uh, defined in this way here. Uh, we can use, uh, uh, exploit the fact that there is the gauge covariance on the whistle line of the whistle line operator. So again, it, it's not important well, the, the point in which this whistle loop starts. So we can select it uh, to be zero. So in general, the whistle loop has this form here. Uh, there is no dependence on the bulk the point. And also, again, thanks to gauge invariance, we are free to choose the gauge. Uh, uh, in particular, we make this choice over here. So we gauge to form the connection omega we defined before. So the, the composition of L minus L1 and L minus one uh, using this uh, gauge uh, group element here in such a way that the transform Wilson, uh, Wilson line, uh, Wilson loop, sorry, uh, acquire this very simple form. Uh, expression here, Q to the L0, where Q again is the uh, modular parameter on the torus. 
um, just to exp to, to, to refer later this, uh, this this choice of the of the gauge is called diagonal gauge. So uh, now we, we are almost done in the construction of uh, the the quantity we are interested in, uh, but we have to um, understand how to built effectively in the sense that in the previous picture, I described uh, a, a particular uh, matrix element, uh, but the kind of construction was, in, let, let's say gra graphically at least, was think about in, in, the, in the sphere topology. Uh, in order to translate this uh, on the torus topology, the idea is to start first with, a, the, with the construction of a three-point function on the sphere in this way, then we identify two of the external fields, so two of the external legs in this case here, uh, identifying the corresponding representation. Uh, this identification um, allows us to, let's say, to construct the, the Wilson loop. But uh, finally, we have to sum over all the possible representation that can run in the, in the loop. So we have this loop here. And looking at the, uh, at the previous formula, what we have done is simply is simply this. So we have identified this uh, representation here with the, with the previous one, and we have some of, summed over the possible the state. Sorry, yeah, probably before I said the representation. Yeah, there's, there is a mistake here. Uh, we sum over all the possible of all the states in the representation. Um, so we want to compute this quantity over here. <coughs> sorry. Um, the, 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 as, as I said, we want to do this in a uh, useful gauge, in particular the diagonal one, in the diagonal gauge in which the uh, Wilson loop uh, acquire a very uh, useful uh, expression. So this one here, as I said. Um, but if we look at the previous formula, the one, uh, the, this one here, uh, in order to get to obtain this, uh, to, to um, yeah, to, to obtain this gauge transform version of the Wilson loop, uh, the only terms that is affected is the external field. Uh, in particular, we have to transform the external field into this transform one, the, the gauge group element, and we choose the lowest weight uh, state of the given representation as the external uh, field. And so, we are almost done. We have almost the quantity that we want to compute. Uh, we are left with another freedom. So due to the translation invariance, we can choose the external point. And in particular, we decide to choose it at zero uh, in such a way that the bulk to boundary with some line becomes trivial. And so we can do rid of it. And in this way, we have obtained this quantity. This is... Uh, what we claim to be true. I mean, this is the quantity that we have constructed, the right hand side, and we uh, claim to be the uh, one point block on the left hand side. And so we uh, we are left with the computation, uh, let's say. Um, the problem that, the, 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 is that the interweaving operator, since it is the, the, that kind of projector of the two representation one, um, is constructed in such a way that its matrix elements are the klebsch gordon coefficient. This. But klebsch gordon for coefficient uh, are uh, not known in general for the set three, uh, up to now. So we try to find a, a, another way to, a, a way to avoid this, this obstruction and to compute this in another, in another way. And in order to do this, we, exploit the fact that uh, every state in a, in a given representation of, an, of the algebra can be expressed as a symmetric traceless tensor. And in particular, we are going also to express this as a product of symmetric traceless tensor of, of uh, yeah, tensor of the fundamental and the fundamental representation. So this is the main idea, but um, let us see how, how it works. First of all, just to, um, uh, yeah, in order to perform the computation, we insert some um, resolution of identities, uh, in particular here and here. In such a way that now we have the product of three matrix elements. So, and we want to compute these, these matrix elements and so on and so forth. Uh, 
let us remember the, the some notation we have labeled the internal representation alpha uh, with these two integers here m1 and m2 in this way uh, while the external uh, representation is labeled by just one integer because it's again semi-degenerate um, so this is the quantity that we want to compute and in particular the quantity that we want to represent as a symmetric resistance uh, so let us start analyzing each factor and see how, how it can be done so this is the formula now we are going to focus on the first uh, matrix element here yeah, this um, it's a matrix. Um, this quantity can be represented in, in terms of the so-called Wigner D matrix so here we, I have the definition. The, this is the um, the quantity we are interested in. In general, alpha is a, a, um, a composition of yeah can be decomposed in terms of fundamental and fundamental representation. In particular, since we have labeled this as M one and M two, it is the, the it is given by uh, the, the corresponding tensor uh, as M one lower indices and m2 upper indices uh, the same is for the for the other alpha there or on the other side uh, we, we we stay general in this case so even if they are the same uh, uh, yeah yeah we are, we are okay we are considering here different indices and in general we call these uh, uh, matrix here with this tensor here we call d this kind of indices structure and uh, again in this uh, uh, the, in, in this decomposition in terms of fundamental and anti-fundamental representation uh, this can be expressed as, as a product of this kind uh, where each of the big dirty matrix in the fundamental or anti-fundamental can be defined in this way here so they are diagonal and okay so this is the represented the, of course i used proportional to because there are some uh, prefactor in front that actually we don't care. It, it's not affecting our final results. So, uh, but yeah, in general, there are not equalities. Mo mo uh, most of the uh, relation that I'm going to give in, the, in this situation like these are up to some constant in front that uh, is not important for our discussion. So this is the first term. Then we move to the last term, the, this one here. This is essentially uh, consisting the coordinates of the transformed lowest wave state. So this is a transformed one here. This state is not the regular one. Um, so in general, the usual lowest state, uh, yeah, I have to correct, but um, the lowest weight state decomposed in terms of the fundamental representation is given just by the composition of uh, uh, E3, uh, the, the lowest uh, weight uh, of the fundamental, uh, eight times. Um, it can be shown that, I don't know, sorry, this was right, I, I didn't see, sorry. Uh, but uh, when we, compute this kind of uh, matrix element from a direct computation is not, we, we know explicitly this uh, gauge uh, group element here. Uh, so we, we, we know how it acts on the E3, so we know exactly how it works. And so this, uh, this quantity here is given by this diagonal quantity here that we call P, just to give it, to give it a name. And so the last term, this one, we are, we are going to, Compute uh, in in this decomposition, of course, uh, can be written in this way. So as again, as a product of uh, this PK a times, where a again, just to remember, is the uh, is the label that uh, parameterizes the external representation. Uh, okay, so we have uh, found the a way to represent the first and the last terms as a, a tensor. Uh, not, 
not yet symmetric at traceless. I'm going to explain why, uh, when we are going to do this, but at this stage, uh, we represented them as tensor. We are left with the, the middle uh, matrix element. And again, with the um, properties of tracelessness and the, uh, and the, the symmetry. So, but we let us explain how now the, the, the story works. Uh, so first of all, we uh, want to uh, construct a tensor with the, let's say, correct structure necessary to represent the block. Um, I say correct because this is not yet the tensor uh, because it is not, uh, the, it does not have the condition of symmetry and translessness. And this is the next step. And also, uh, we have not time over. Uh, so the first uh, step is to construct this kind of uh, tensor here, uh, in which we put also the representation for the intervening operator, which is the missing part here. And then we impose at the end the, the conditions that we need. And finally, uh, we have to sum over the all the all the state as we as we explain all the internal state and in order to do this we have to consider this kind of co contraction here. so we have to identify the uh, upper uh, between of, of one side to the other side and the lower of one side with the, one of the other side so let us start construct with the first step here so let us construct this uh, tensor with the again correct quote unquote uh, structure um in order to do this, let us start with the quantity that we have defined yet, we have uh, represented yet. So we introduce this tensor T. Uh, this is essentially the, the, let's say, the product of, the, of what we have found before. So simply given by this product of the Wigner D matrix in the, again, fundamental and anti-fundamental and this uh, P over here. Now we want to consider the action of the intervening operator. And these intervening operators act simply as a projector, as I said. So uh, this is the um, property that we are going to use. So since it is a projector, we want to insert here a tensor that represents this projection. And uh, so this is the, the, the tensor I was talking before with the correct structure. But now we have to find also because we have, we know this tensor here. We have to find the explicit expression of the pro, of the projection tensor P. So in general, P has to be SL3 invariant. Uh, in order to do this, it, it has to be a composition of the invariant tensor, SL3 invariant tensor, which are in general are delta and the two Levi Civita tensor. We know that the result has to be traceless. Uh, symmetric, so we can now we we, we move uh, back and forth a bit in, in this in this case. So because we know where we want to go, so we we forget about stuff that at the end will count. So, um, for instance, just to say, but uh, the 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 projection the the p the the tensor p. Cannot uh, be cannot present a tensor of the, this kind here. Otherwise, it does not respect the, uh, uh, the the right symmetry structure. And so, uh, with, with this kind of uh, it's, it's not so difficult, but it's, uh, counting the indices and uh, so on and so forth, we we can find the explicit the explicit form of P. Uh, but before this, we found also another uh, peculiarity of this case. That is the fact that the integer a that parameterizes the external dimension has to be a multiple of three. So it has to be of this kind here. Uh, this uh, is a peculiarity of this case. First of all, because it, it does not uh, appear uh, this kind of restriction in the SL2 case. Uh, it, it is essentially due to the fact that we have upper and lower indices here. Uh, and this force, the, this uh, relation here. Um, and so, okay. 
remember this fact, uh, we find that the projector we were looking for uh, can be expressed in this way. This kind of product of deltas and uh, uh, Levitschivita tensors. So now we can put everything together. We can put this explicit expression over here and found the explicit expression of the tensor M here. Uh, we do this and we obtain this. I mean, it's, I know it's a lot of uh, uh, symbols, and, but yeah, it's not so. Uh, it's kind of algebraic, uh, algebra and nothing more. So here we have introduced two more definition just to, for, for notational reason, where P bar is defined in this way and A is defined in this way here. Yeah? So this tensor, again, that we constructed in this situation is essentially given by this product here, but again, without the conditions. So now we have to impose the conditions uh, and then we have to sum. So the first condition is the symmetry. Uh, the, the, the symmetry, uh, let's say that we impose, uh, let's say in a, in a formal way. So we write in this way, so now M becomes uh, symmetric in, in these indices here. Uh, at this stage, it seems that nothing changed. Uh, of course, when we do the actual contraction, we have to remember that we have to consider the cyclic, cyclic permutation of these indices, but it's fine. Uh, just to notice, since at the end, we have to consider the contraction between uh, the left upper and left and right upper indices and left lower and, and uh, right lower indices. It, it's enough if we, if we make symmetry just one side, not both, because then we have to contract. So it's not necessary. Uh, finally, the, we have to uh, impose the trends. The, the, we have to make this tensor traceless. In order to do this, we use this kind of this relation here. It was introduced by Krauss and collaborators in a paper in which they study uh, a similar situation, but on the sphere. Uh, so st starting from this uh, symmetric tensor M, now it is, is, is the symmetric one, uh, we obtain also a symmetric tensor, traceless tensor of this kind uh, with, with OK, it's a this coefficient. So now, we have finally obtained the tensor that represents, sorry, if I go back, that represents this product. Now the, it is this M tilde. Again, as I said, the, the last step consists in taking the sum. Taking the sum means taking the traces, these traces over here. This appears again clear the fact that it is not necessary to make both sides symmetric in this, this because we are contracting in this way. And so this. Finally, this is the quantity that we claim to, uh, to, to give the one point uh, conformal block on the torus. Uh, we, uh, unfortunately, we had not found a general expression from this contraction. Uh, we check this in numerically for some situation from, yeah, uh, some specific representation considered. And all the uh, all the results that we obtain confirm the fact that the, this gives the right result. But again, uh, we didn't find a general uh, form expression up to now. Uh, so just to give a brief conclusion, just uh, to want to point out some possible um, extension of the world generalization, apart from, of course, finding the general form of this computation. Uh, first of all, we have to notice that up to now we have considered just, let's say, classical situation because we are in this limit for C that goes to infinity. And, uh, the, the first idea would be to try to take into account also quantum effect, uh, quantum effect and yeah, quantum correction, but um, up to now uh, there is no, evidence now to do this, uh, we, we don't know. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so, um, 
it would be interesting maybe to find um, uh, a relation between this method here of the Wilson network operator and the uh, presence of possible multiplicity. So uh, avoid the um, the restriction of the on the external field to be semi-degenerate, allowing so the presence of multiplicities and to see if. Uh, it's something, let's say something happened from this Wilson network uh, technique. Uh, we, we try to, to see something, but it requires more uh, uh, investigation. And so, so thank you. Uh, I don't know if you have questions about. Yeah, thank you. Questions, please. Yeah, so what's the simplest way to compute the conform of this block is to use a GT formula, right? I mean, the last part seems to be very complicated. I mean, yeah, yeah. The, the fact is that um, it seems uh, it, it, in general it could be a it could give an exact result. Uh, I mean, this is what what it, it does in the in other situation. So with uh, let's say uh, combinatorial techniques, maybe. Uh, sim let's say simply combinatorial technique, easy combinatorial techniques, we can obtain an exact result. Uh, but yeah, uh, up to now it seems difficult. Uh, so yeah, so, so, yeah, I was a bit confused. In SL2 case, I mean, global blocks are not, can, can be expressed as hypergeometric functions, but here, yeah. for SL2, this is not the case. Am I right? Yeah. So this expression yeah. is not is not known in, and it is not expected to be some simple function. Um, uh, yeah, no, you're right. It's, we have no clue on the other side. Why? Yeah, as I said, as you said, in the virusor case, we have uh, evidence from the other from the CFT. We know uh, a close expression. Uh, in this case of W three and S three, we we don't saw. So, it's just an, uh, it, it seems, let's say, when, when one try to do computation in, in this uh, Wilson network operator seems, it can be done something, but actually there is no evidence that, uh, in, in fact, it can be finest result. So yeah, you're right. <laughs> we don't have this, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I see. So in general, the, the coefficients they're not they're not like they're not the products of of simple factors. They just still they still some. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by the way, what's the is when it. I would say it. it's been in physics behind all this. I mean, uh, have you confirmed some some statement from idea CFT by this calculation, or doesn't does your I mean does your computation contradict the general idea of idea CFT, or it or it confirms it, or you just probably you just presented the correct thing to be computed on the idea side. To compare with the classical conform block, what's what's the correct statement? Probably alpha statement is correct. Uh, uh, sorry, I don't know if I, if I understand. Um, well, I, I mean, in principle, the general strategy is you 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 comparing um, like objects from different worlds, right? Mm -hmm. On other on one in left um, hand, you have is. This large C, uh, large central charge objects from CFT, such mm -hmm. as conform blocks. On the other hand, you have some things computed in ADS, right? Yeah. Side. Usually you compare, but 
here you probably have said that it was um, an obvious from the beginning what type of object you have to consider in the edges side so in a way uh, i mean your results can be formulated as we have found the correct object in it it is site to compare with the classical limit of conform block right you... yeah 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 this, this is the idea uh the fact is that in the other case it was done uh exactly let's say exactly uh, ah. yeah i mean in the sorry i have to explain what are the other cases so in in the s2 on the torus you mm -hmm. know what there is from the cft and we we can compute exactly what is uh, here with this method so we uh, it can be found that um, this method gives what we expected for the cft mm -hmm. and we we try to do the same here but yeah we don't know what we have we, we have no expectation for this CFT side apart from a, an expansion uh, and in fact this is what we the way in which we uh, try to uh, Let's say to to verify. Then at, at the end we we compute, but we uh, we match with the expansion that we have for CFT. Uh, mm -hmm. But in fact, there is also a let's say a strange and clear fact, uh, which is this this limit here, the this uh, this cost, yeah condition this, here because this is additional constraint or what uh, i just missed it also this is yeah yeah no it comes from the from the construction here of the of the projector uh, i mean it's just on counting because when, when we project these uh number of the, these uh let's say uh when we contract these indices here mm -hmm. with these uh, these indices here we we expect to find exactly m2 indices so with this simple counting, it's just to count, okay, I have to this, this, kind, this kind of contraction, I will take this kind of indices, this number. Mm -hmm. We found that, okay, in order for this, uh, uh, for this contraction to be non-zero, to, to give us a result, something that it makes sense, uh, A has to be a multiple of three. It's just computation. But, um, yeah, we don't know why, because apparently from the CFT side, the, the, there is no uh, obstruction for A to be multiple of three or not. It's, it's an effect of this. But here yeah, for, for SL2 case, A should the, also be divided by two. No. No, in the SL2 case, there is no, no such problem. And also on the sphere, there is no such contrast. But, but A, um, yes, yeah, so the inter, sorry. And there's no such yeah. problem. No. Probably it's related somehow to multiplicity. So, I mean, in SL3 representations, you have multiplicities. Uh, uh, it is a possibility. Also, it, it seems that here, at least the difference from uh, the SL2 case comes from the fact that in SL2, we have no upper and lower indices. We just know. And mm -hmm. so we have not this kind of contraction. Uh, the, the projector P is much easier because it's just a composition of uh, Levi Civita tensor. Uh, so, it, and this is from the computational side, let's, uh, let's say. But yeah, the reason is up to now, it's not clear to us. Mm -hmm. It is interesting, yeah, of course, but we have no clue on this. Okay, thank you. Other questions?